Uh, we are uh, moving through the Apostles' Creed, and we began with, uh, everybody knows the first part, right? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And we talked about the, the nature of God our Father. We talked about how He is both Father and Almighty. He is Father, the deeply personal, relational side of our understanding of God but also Almighty, the all-powerful, the, the all-encompassing majesty and, and revered nature of God. We talked about Him being the maker of heaven and earth and how with a, a single word He spoke the world into existence. And then we shifted the next week to talking about uh, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And so when we talked about Jesus Christ... His only Son, our Lord, we, we focus that week primarily on our understanding of who Jesus is as Scripture reveals Jesus to be. We spent a lot of time in the Gospel of John that week looking at the way that John describes our understanding of who Jesus is. We talked about how He was the one who was full of grace and truth. Yes, full of grace and truth. That He is one who's not only graceful, but also had the truth aspect as well. And we talked about how he was with God from the beginning. He was the word that existed from the beginning. And then spent some time studying the I am statements, those statements that described his character, described his nature. He is the way to eternal life. He is the vine that keeps us connected to God. He is the good shepherd that lays down his life for his sheep. Then last week, uh, we, we had a lot of fun. Um, we shifted into talking about Jesus' life. We covered everything from Christmas to Good Friday last week. Uh, it was pretty incredible. Um, it takes us several months during the regular year, but we covered it all in one night. And we talked about how Jesus was, first of all, Conceived, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Now, uh, Charles Adams was on our Zoom link last week, and uh, afterwards, uh, I was talking to him, and he said, I really wish you had spent more time talking about the virgin birth. And he raised, like, all these hypothetical questions. And so next time you see Charles, ask him what the answer is to all of those. Um, he wasn't here to ask the question, so unfortunately I was able to provide my insight. So next time you see Charles, make sure he has an opportunity to describe to you uh, his understanding of the virgin birth. I think that would be really good for everyone. So um, and you can tell him I sent you. Uh, and then we talked about how he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. And uh, actually, I guess if you want to be technical, we left off last week with, with Jesus in the grave. Holy Saturday, he was there in the grave. And what we left off with was that, that old saying, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. On the original Good Friday, they didn't know Sunday was coming. Jesus had been telling them that Sunday was coming, but they didn't know that Sunday was coming. They thought it was over. They thought it was the end. Well, the good news for us is this week, we pick up with the rest of the story. Anybody remember Paul Harvey? It's, uh, you know, now the rest of the story. And so we pick up with after Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, what happens next in our creed. And so uh, what I want to invite us to do is as we go into our next part of the creed, Let's say the creed up until that point all together. So let's join together. Ready? And I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge quick. Alright, and we can pause right there. So that is what we are going to cover tonight. Is everything from crucified, dead, and buried. We left off there last week. We're going to cover everything from that point to him judging the, the living and the dead, the quick and the dead. 
And uh, we just, by luck of the draw, uh, we do not normally recite one particular phrase in uh, the Apostles' Creed. Does anyone know what we normally skip over? What's that? He descended to the dead. He descended to the dead. Yes, he descended to the dead. Now, the, the reason that we skip over it is, I'm not sure. Uh, it, it was part of the original creed, and th- this will be um, maybe, unfortunately, not shocking to some of you. The United Methodist Church can't even figure out if they believe in it or not, because uh, in one version in our hymnal, it says he descended to the dead. In another version, it doesn't say it. And so uh, it hasn't been a fundamental part of Christian teaching over the centuries, but where that comes from, in case you want to ace a Bible test one day and someone's drilling you on the Apostles' Creed, is go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, it describes in 1 Peter chapter 3 that once he went into the grave, uh, he didn't stay stagnant. He went down into, as it's called there, into prison. He went into prison where souls were held captive and he spoke to the spirits that had been held there since the days of Noah. So there you go. Um, that, that's all we know. Uh, Peter is, is presumably the writer of that letter. Peter walked and lived with Jesus and then was one of the founders of the early Christian church. Peter said it happened. We believe in it, but we don't really have a lot to work with there on, on what happened. We don't know what their response was. We don't know what came of it. We just know that, that Jesus had been teaching every single day and healing people. And he had to stay in the grave for a couple of days. And so he decided to get busy. He went down to prison to whoever he could preach to. And so uh, that happened. And that's about all we know about it. So anyone want to carry, share to carry any, care to share any more insights on that? If you have any further questions, uh, I will give you Charles Adams' phone number at the end of the uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let him off the hook on that one. All right, so the very next part we get to is, we're not there yet in the Christian year, but for tonight we get to enter into it. Crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, He rose from the dead. So we're going to look at uh, the account of the Gospel writer Luke tonight. So if you got your Bibles, let's flip to Luke chapter 24. And we're going to stay with Luke for uh, a couple of these different segments that we find in the Apostles' Creed. We'll, we'll start with Luke's Gospel, and then Luke also is the writer of the book of Acts, and so we'll jump to what he shares there. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, bringing the fragrant spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. They didn't know what to make of this. Suddenly, two men were standing beside them in gleaming bright clothing. The women were frightened and bowed their faces toward the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but has been raised. Remember what he told you while he was still in Galilee? That the human one must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. When they returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Their words struck the apostles as nonsense, and they didn't believe the women. But Peter ran to the tomb, and when he bent over to look inside, he saw only the linen cloth. Then he returned home, wondering what had happened. So this is Luke's story of what happened on that very first Easter Sunday. Uh, We have a case of the women figuring something out and the men not listening and calling it nonsense. Uh, Not the only time in history this has happened, 
but uh, it, it is a, a feat that happened on that day of resurrection. Now, there are some interesting things within this. There's the question that the two men who were there at the tomb asked of the women. Why do you look for the living among the dead? What does that tell us right away about the nature of the resurrection? Has Jesus simply disappeared from the grave? He's alive. He's alive. And so the, the very nature of where they are, they find themselves there at a tomb. They're at a place of burial. And the men are sitting there looking at him. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why would you come to a place of death when Jesus is supposed to be alive? And they have to have this whole conversation with him about remember what he said. And Jesus has been hinting at this. He's been alluding to this. He's been point blank saying, and on the third day, this will happen. And yet, Jesus doesn't get the point across, or rather the disciples don't get the point that he's making. And so they still are thinking Jesus is in the grave. Jesus was placed in the grave. No one has ever seen someone raised other than Lazarus. Uh, they, they saw Lazarus and a couple of other uh, people being raised for, from death. But if Jesus is in a tomb that is sealed, they wouldn't expect that tomb to open without some sort of divine impact happening. And if Jesus is the one in the tomb, and he's the one that they've seen actually doing it, who's going to perform that miracle? Who's going to do it? But yet, the first message of Easter is, why would you be looking for the living among the dead? Why would you be looking for the living among the dead? Now, then we get the, the whole conversation about they, they go and tell the disciples. The disciples think it's utter nonsense. They didn't believe the women. But what does Peter do? Peter, he goes to check it out. He, 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 said, he says, I think this is nonsense too, but I'm up for an adventure. And he goes to, to check it out. Goes to see what's going on. So this story tells us what we know and what we read and what we celebrate as being a part of Easter Sunday. So, kind of put a pin in that. That's, that's the opening of the narrative. We've begun with Luke sharing that. And as our, our creed goes, on the third day he rose from the dead. Then it says he ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. All right, so flip in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to read a little bit of the story of uh, what happens with the early church after Luke's gospel concludes with Jesus' ministry, life, death, and resurrection. Then he begins his second book, the book of Acts, as a description of what happened to Jesus' followers following the ascension. And so the very first part of this is the story of the ascension. And it begins, Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1, reading through 11. It says, Theophilus, the first scroll I wrote concerned everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning, right up to the day when he was taken up into heaven. Before he was taken up, working in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed the disciples he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. While they were eating together, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, this is what you heard from me. John baptized with water, but in only a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? Jesus replied, it isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away, and as they were staring towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes, two men have shown up again, stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. All right, so this is the story of the ascension. And I guess because it doesn't fall on a Sunday, we good Protestants aren't very good at celebrating the ascension. It falls 40 days after Easter, and so it falls on a Thursday every year. And then we get to the next week, and it's usually Memorial Day weekend, and nobody's in town anyways. And so we just kind of gloss over the ascension and, and never really talk about it. But this is the incredible moment where Jesus describes what's going to happen when he goes up. And he doesn't talk about it from the standpoint of what he's going to do. Who does he talk about it from the perspective of? What they are going to do. What they are going to do. And so they think of it in terms of, is, is this the finality? Is this where the kingdom as we know it and the kingdom as we desire for it to be is going to be restored? And so verse 5, I'm sorry, verse 6 they asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? And Jesus replied, it isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, rather. Now, the Bible is full of all these really good words that, that redirect us. Rather, it is Jesus' way of saying... Um, you're thinking about it from this perspective, but I'd rather you think about it from this perspective. Let's shift what we're thinking about to what you're actually going to be asked to do. And essentially, what, what is he saying in this? He's saying, should, should you really be worrying about this? All that you are asked to worry about is the task that God has given you. And what does that task look like? They are to be what? Witnesses. All right, so what comes to your mind when you hear that word witness? What, what's that, right? Trial? Yeah, uh, but you think trial. You think witnesses are brought to either to shed light on what has happened. We think of, of eyewitnesses. Have any of you ever been a, a witness in a, a case of, of any sort? Um, I was told when I was in uh, political science class that I would be useless as a witness because I have a really good memory and I remember every detail. And my political science teacher told me when I, he, he asked some random question, where were you on such and such day, such and such time in the morning? And I rattled off where I was, what I was doing, who I was with. And, and he says, you would be completely useless as a, a witness because you remember too many details and they think you were making it up. <laughs> so, um, but in, in the case of the biblical witness, you want them to be as accurate as possible. And, and so what does it mean to be a witness? When someone is a witness, you will be my witnesses. That's a key distinguisher there. You'll be my witnesses. What does it mean for them to be Jesus' witnesses. Tell others what they've seen and heard. Absolutely. And it, I think of it not just from the standpoint of what they've seen and heard, but also they are representing him. They are representing who he is. They're not just uh, called to the witness stand. And Jesus isn't just saying, people are going to demand an account of what's going on and and you guys are going to have to provide that with this account because you saw it happen. He's saying, no, no, you will be my witnesses. You will be the ones who will bear testimony, not just to what you've seen and heard, but to who you belong to and what it means to belong to, to me. And so the ascension moment is this powerful moment in which Jesus says, I'm going up into heaven. 
you are going to be called to remain as my witnesses. I'm going up into heaven. You've got a job to do. And, and the job that they are called to do is to be the witnesses. Now, uh, th this is a, a fun little tidbit. Uh, where does he call for them to be witnesses? It's kind of like a drawing a circle and moving its way out. In Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Okay, so uh, this is the way that I would describe it um, in, in today's terms. Okay? Uh, you are called to be the witnesses of Jesus in Valdosta, in the southeastern United States, the other side of the railroad tracks in the southeastern United States. That was kind of Samaria. They were the part they didn't want to go into. And to the ends of the earth. Not just your region, not just your country, not just your people, but everywhere. And so the calling of being witnesses of Jesus, it's a, it's a local, regional, other side of the tracks, and all the way to the ends of the world. So if anyone uh, ever gets into a debate about whether we should do missions in our community, or if we should do missions overseas, or if we should do missions in other parts of the country, your answer is... Yes, yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> so if people are, are debating it, the, 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 wherever you feel like God is leading you to serve, uh, if it falls within any of the categories of here, there, and all the way to the ends of the earth, it, it is within the purview of what God calls us to do in being witnesses for Jesus. And so we, we, we know in our creed, He ascended to the right hand of the Father. And so we, we get this description of he is taken up from them. It says in verse 9, they were watching and he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So if he is taken out of their perspective, a cloud takes him out of their sight, what, what does that tell us about where he went? Where did he go? He went up. Do we know where he went from there? No, but we got every reason to believe he was alive, he was, a, he, was a, he was a being, he was ascending to wherever it is that he was ascending. And we, we know that he went fu fully as the Son of God to sit at the right hand of the Father. And, and the, the two witnesses show up again, and they say, we don't know if it's the same ones from the tomb, but two witnesses show up again. And they, they essentially say, this Jesus who was taken from you will, will appear and come back in the same way you saw him go into heaven. So, uh, we, we know also from our creed, he will come again. And so, we, we have within this our understanding of, of Jesus doesn't just die, raise from the grave, and then hang out for a while. What, what, what happened to Lazarus? We, we don't have an um, obituary on Lazarus, but we're pretty confident that Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus, and then they had another funeral for him later on. Um, that's not the case with Jesus. Jesus didn't die on Good Friday, go into the grave, and then rise on Easter Sunday in the same way that Lazarus did. He was raised into a new kind of being. He was raised into uh, something completely new, something that was eternal. And so when we hear that, we know that Jesus is, has not died. Well, he did. But he rose again from the dead, and he has not died since. He has lived living forever at the right hand of God the Father. So that is kind of like our overview of the narrative that leads to this. The rest of what we're going to talk about tonight is, okay, what does it mean? Okay, what does it mean for us? What does this look like in our lives? So, let's flip now to Colossians chapter 3.
All right, Colossians chapter 3 uh, is, is one of the, the texts that show up sometimes on uh, Easter Sunday. And it is a, a beautiful description of what life in Christ looks like. And so I'm going to read this. Um, I'll, I'll skip over the racing parts. You can go back and read it later. But uh, I'll just kind of, keep, in the interest of time, keep going. It says, Therefore, if you were raised with Christ, look for the things that are above where Christ is sitting at God's right side. So this is Paul writing several years after the ascension. Where is Jesus still? At the right hand of the Father. Okay, so we, we still know and believe that, that God has at His right side Jesus sitting there. Think about the things above and not the things on earth. You died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. So put to death the parts of your life that belong to the earth, such as, and then he lists off a whole list of, of vices, and then pick up in verse 7. You used to live this way when you were alive to these things, but now set aside these things such as anger, rage, malice, slander, and obscene language, and don't lie to each other. Take off the old human nature with its practices and put on the new nature, which is renewed in knowledge by conforming to the image of the one who created it. In this image, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all things and in all people. So there is uh, an ancient practice of baptism, and we, we understand baptism in, in the way that we visualize it in our churches today. Uh, in our church, we have a, a baptismal font. We believe that through the gift of, of water and the grace of, of God that it, it demonstrates and marks a child or an adult's life as belonging to God. And some people uh, in, in some churches, even the Methodist Church will practice it. It's available practice by full immersion. In the ancient church, and well, in the, the early church, they did most of their baptisms with pouring of water. Water was scarce, and so uh, if you didn't have access to a body of water, typically you would have water poured over your head to symbolize it. But when they started building churches, this passage was actually a guiding passage for how they thought about baptism. And the way that they would design their baptismal pools was essentially like this. You're on flat ground. You dig a hole into the ground. There are steps that go down. There's actual baptismal pool. There are steps that come up the other side, and then you're back on the flat ground. And what they believed was that in your baptism, what you were doing was you were literally going and burying into the ground your old life. You were putting to death that which belonged to your earthly nature. You were going into the earth just as Jesus had gone into a tomb. You were going into the earth, leaving that life behind. And then what did you do on the other side? You were risen with Christ. It was the entire imagery of Good Friday to Easter. And it was this idea of you went, your, your sin and your earthly life went to die with Jesus on the cross, was buried in the ground, and you arose as someone brand new on the other side. Uh, it's a beautiful image. Um, I don't think I have the permission of the trustees to uh, dig an earth and hole in the middle of the sanctuary, but uh, it, it would be great to do baptisms that way because I, I, I love the symbolism and the beauty of that. But what we find within that is that when we experience the resurrection in our lives, when we experience the death of sin and being born into a new life, what we experience is what? What happens to us? Renewed. Yes, we're, we are changed. We are made brand new. We are no longer that old self. We are instead made, as Paul says to the Corinthian church, we are a new creation. We are born into something new. 
And so when we participate in the resurrection, we experience that. Now, let's think about this from the perspective of what it says right there at the beginning. If you are raised with Christ, look for the things that are above where Christ is sitting at God's right side. That's right at the beginning of chapter 3 of Colossians. Look for the things that are above where Christ is sitting at God's right side. Let's ponder that for a minute. What do, what do we think of when we think of Jesus sitting at God's right side and the things that we should think of that are on that level? When we think of the way of earth, what do we think of? Sin, dirty, graven, leads to death. But when we think of heaven, what do we see? Glory. Glory, yeah. We see an eternal life. When, when, the, when the disciples were looking up to heaven, and seeing Jesus going up into a cloud, ascending as they knew He would to the right hand of the Father. Do you think all of that finished and then they turned to one another and said, you want to go hit the slot machines and grab a beer? I mean, you know, they, they probably weren't thinking in terms of their earthly nature. Their eyes were fixated on above. So what does that look like in our lives? What does that look like for us to model that? If Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, what does that mean for us as we think about where Jesus is positioned? How should we live our lives? We should live our lives communicating with them. Yes. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, for one thing, we, we know that Jesus is there. Uh, the next verse we're going to look at, it, it talks about his role there at the right hand of the Father. Um, and so we're, we're thinking of it in terms of uh, where he is. What's that? He's our advocate, yes. Uh, interceding on our behalf. Just abiding in him mm -hmm. as he abides in us. Abiding in Him, yes. So when you abide in Jesus, what does your life look like? It looks more like Jesus. Gl glor glorify? Glorify Him. It will glorify Him. Right. Right. It, it, it emulates how He lived, uh, His Spirit, the fruit of His Spirit, that our lives should reflect the, the depths of His love, the depths of His of his glory and and Paul goes on to describe it uh, this way he says in verse 12 therefore is God's choice holy and loved put on compassion kindness humility gentleness and patience do you think Paul just pulled those words out of thin air or were those words that he saw in the lifestyle of Jesus was that something he saw in the character of who Jesus is? And so all of this is couched in that if we have been raised with Jesus, if our lives have been made new and our lives have been changed as well, we ought to live our lives in a way that reflects that. And so we don't reflect that when we continue in the pattern of this world. We reflect that when we look like Jesus looked like. And, and so he calls upon these words, Holy, loved, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then, oh, it gets more fun. Be tolerant with each other. And if anyone has a complaint against anyone, forgive each other. As the Lord forgave you, so also forgive each other. And over all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And then the peace of Christ must control your hearts. A peace into which you were called in one body. And be thankful people. It's exciting. Um, and be thankful. Let the church bells ring. Amen. Um, so, w within this, we hear a call to live differently. 
And, and I think of it from the perspective of if Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. We looked at um, when we looked at Philippians at the end of last week. We looked at Philippians chapter two, and it talked about the attitude and the mindset of Jesus. How he had this mindset of humility. He humbled himself even to uh, obedience to death, death on the cross. And, and through that, God exalted him and gave him the name that was above all other names. And that every knee in heaven and every knee on earth would bow at the name of Jesus. That when we bow at the name of Jesus, we are, we are acknowledging that he is not just our Savior. He is not just the Son of God, but he is Lord. He is Lord. And, and that term Lord is one that denotes being a sense of governance over our lives, a sense of control and allegiance within us. And so when we think of Jesus as Lord, it goes hand in hand with him being at the right hand of the Father. He is one we look up to. He is one that when we look up to, we, we think of heavenly things. We don't think of the things of this earth. It changes who we are and governs how we live our lives. And so with that, we have a model. We have an example. We have a calling upon our lives to be resurrection people, to be people of Easter, to be those who have experienced the new life of Christ and that it did not leave us the same. It left us changed. And our lives are governed and oriented by keeping our eyes fixed above to the one who is above all other names. So that is, in a sense, you know, diving into not just the narrative of what happens in the resurrection and what happens in the ascension. It, that is what resonates with how we orient our lives in response to who Jesus is. Because ultimately, the, the way of faith is, is about knowing who Jesus is and knowing how our lives ought to be oriented because of who Jesus is and because of what he calls us to do and who he calls us to be. All right, so we're going to flip to Hebrews chapter 9. And Hebrews is, uh, it's one of those that, if you've ever been asked the question, uh, if you could only have one book in the entire world, if you were on a deserted island, what would it be? You know the correct answer is the Bible. Yeah, it's, it's that, that's, that's the answer you're supposed to say. Um, and so you would say the Bible. Um, and then people like to, to drill you down a little further. Well, if you could only have one book, what would it be? You probably wouldn't come up with Hebrews, but uh, I love Hebrews. It, it, it would be on my short list because I think Hebrews does an incredible job of tying together both of the Testaments and explaining and understanding uh, all of the imagery that we see in the Old Testament and how it unfolds through the life and ministry death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And so within it, there, there is this kind of um, one-upmanship. If you've ever been around people who, who are one-uppers, you know, you know what I'm talking about, a one-upper? Um, you tell a story about a fish that you caught and it was this big and they can't wait to tell you about the one they caught that was this big. And then you say, well, I caught one that big that one time. Well, let me tell you about the one I caught this other time. And, you know, the, the, the fish just keeps growing and growing and growing. And uh, the, it, it, it's hilarious. You, you see it with uh, kids and then you see it in adults. It's, it moves from cute to sad. Uh, anyway, so um, one-upmanship is a common human trait but it also was an ancient style of writing. And that's essentially what the letter to the Hebrews is. The, the letter of Hebrews is essentially, you've heard of Moses, Jesus was better. You've heard of the earthly tabernacle, the heavenly tabernacle is better. You've heard of angels, Jesus is better. I mean, it, it really is everything you've understood in your faith, everything you've understood in your understanding of the symbolic world of, of the historic 
faith of the nation of the Hebrews, that what we see in Jesus is not in a uh, childish, immature, one-upmanship way, but in, in a, an articulation of faith of the actual glory of who Jesus is, you see that he is greater than all of those things of earth, all of those things of religions of past that were just a foreshadowing of what we would encounter in Jesus. So we're going to pick up in chapter 9 in verse 24. And the context of this is uh, just real briefly in the Old Testament, there was a, a setup known as the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was uh, set up in such a way that there was a place called the Holy of Holies. And then within the Holy of Holies, there was a place called the Most Holy Place. And the Most Holy Place, only the high priest could go in there, and he could only go in there once a year, uh, the Day of Atonement, to offer sacrifices on behalf of all peoples. And so what we discover in Hebrews is the imagery of Jesus as that high priest that goes on our behalf, not only as the priest, not only as the king, but also as the sacrifice himself. And he goes and offers the sacrifice once and for all. And in verse 24 of chapter 9, it says, Christ didn't enter the holy place, which is a copy of the true holy place made by human hands, but into heaven itself, so that he now appears in God's presence for us. Who was talking about him being the... Um, Sally and Lynn here were talking about him being the advocate and being there on our behalf. So he is there in God's presence for us. For us. And then it says, He didn't enter to offer himself over and over again like the high priest enters the earthly holy place every year with blood that isn't his. If that were so, then Jesus would have had to suffer many times as the foundation of the world. Instead, he has now appeared once at the end of the ages to get rid of sin by sacrificing himself. People are destined to die once and then face judgment. In the same way, Christ was also offered once to take on himself the sins of many people. He will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting. So this is where we get our understanding of Jesus is there interceding on our behalf. We see that, that he is, is doing that on our behalf and that people who are destined to die face judgment. But what will be the case for those who belong to Jesus? This is the good news of the gospel. You should know this one. <laughs> What's that? Eternal life, yes. We, we, I mean, we will be judged, but Jesus is there to vouch on our behalf. And so we will not face the punishment of judgment. We will instead encounter the salvation of eternal life. We will encounter the salvation and the joy of belonging to Jesus. And so we find within that that, that his death, his mediation on our behalf, was for the sake of us. And Him being in the presence of God, it's for the sake of us. It's not just His name being above all other names, but it is for God's reconciliation of His people unto Himself. That's what we encounter in Jesus. We encounter that his, it goes all the way in our creed to um, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead or the quick and the dead, depending on which translation of the original creed you're, you're looking at. But he, he will come to judge them, but the context of his judgment is that those who belong to him, John 3.16, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we find within this image of Jesus, the ascended <laughs> mediator on our behalf. We encounter Jesus as one who, who is there for us. All right, so let's go back. We're, we're going to tie this together as we wrap up tonight. Let's go back. The women are at the tomb. 
What's the message to the women at the tomb? He's alive. Don't, don't look for the living among the dead. Then, then we go to the ascension. What happens at the ascension? What's the message there? We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. And what happens to Jesus? He goes to the right hand of the Father. He, he doesn't die. He continues to live on. And then what do we find in our understanding of of the New Testament writers as they describe the role of Jesus. What is Jesus doing now? He's alive. He's alive. And so the, the message of Jesus is, is life. The message of Jesus is that He is alive. That He is there on our behalf. We have a responsibility until He comes and takes us back to Him to be His witnesses throughout all the earth. And why are we called to be His witnesses into all the earth? Because He's there at the right hand of the Father wanting all to come and encounter Him at the right hand of the Father and to inherit eternal life. And so it, it all ties together in, in this, this beautiful context of the resurrection is this foundational element of everything that we believe because it is life. And we, when we are raised to new life through Jesus, we are able to put to death the life that is behind us, the life that it belongs to this earth. And instead, enter into a new way of living that completely changes everything for us. I want to ask, how many people can you think of that when you see it, you just know without a shadow of a doubt, those are resurrection Easter people? Can you think of a few people come to your mind? What's kind of a common thread with people like that that you can count it? What's that? Joy. joy. Yeah. And what is their joy rooted in? The relationship with God. Absolutely. I very rarely hear people who are filled with that joy and desire that relationship talking about earthly things that much. Their eyes are set their eyes are set on something beyond what we see around us. And for the calling of Jesus to, to live in His way is to live in such a way that our eyes are fixated on Him. Uh, as the writer of Hebrews says in, in verse 1-3 through three of chapter 12, he says it this way. He says, Let's run with endurance the race laid out in front of us since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let's throw off any extra baggage. It's the worldly. Get rid of the sin that trips us up and fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame for the sake of the joy that was laid out in front of him and sat down at the right side of God's throne. And then it says, think about the one who endured such op opposition from sinners so that you won't be discouraged and you won't give up. And so our calling is to keep our eyes fixed on the prize, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, and to let that shape the way that we live our lives. Because we have not called to an earthly kingdom. We have been called to a heaven. And we have been called to orient our lives along the same pattern of how Jesus went from the grave and was raised through the power of God so that we can be free from the, the death of sin, free from the death and the bondage of this earth, and instead be filled with, with the joy of an eternal kingdom and everlasting life. And so next week, we're going to continue our journey, and we're going to talk about I Believe In. What's next? Anybody? Holy Spirit, yes. We, we covered the other two. Who's the other one? Okay. Yes, the Holy Spirit uh, is next week. And we will talk about the Holy Spirit. And then our final week before Easter, we get to cover all those random sayings um, that fall at the end of it. I believe in this, 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 this and anything else that we might have left off. Um, so that, that, that's what we get to in the last week. But the next week, it's all about the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, we talked about the Holy Spirit this past Sunday. We'll talk about the Holy Spirit again on Sunday. 
And then we'll talk about the Holy Spirit next Wednesday. And so if you made it on Sunday, if you're coming this Sunday, and you come next Wednesday, you're still going to just scratch the surface of the Holy Spirit. So keep coming back to church. Um, so <laughs> but you'll, you'll at least have a better understanding when we get to that point. And then, um, and then we get to have a lot of fun when we talk about the Holy Catholic Church. That's always a good one uh, that people enjoy talking about. So uh, look forward to that. But go forth in peace. Go forth with your eyes set ahead, facing towards Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who is at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. Amen.